Why don't you all stand up for a second and shake it off. You all look good in your uniforms. Where's the young fellow who lost his? Yeah. Don't feel bad. I've done something like that in my career. Sit down, everybody. The reason why I had you stand up, I'm going to speak for about, uh, well, probably 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I thought long and hard about what I would talk to you about. Um, I had a soft speech, and then I decided, you know what, you all deserved, uh, because you made such a commitment to our country, you deserve to uh, hear a little bit about what I see in the world today. So, first off, I want to join everybody in congratulating you. Uh, it's a great honor. Uh, it's an honor for me and General P and uh, the George C. Marshall Foundation to have an opportunity to be with you for two or three days, because you are the future of our Army, but also the future of our country. Uh, you're here because you've been identified as the best and the brightest, uh, with great potential to succeed, not just in the Army, but in life in itself. And during your ROTC career, you've sweated, you've studied, some of you. Uh, you've pushed yourself to the best. And the George C. Marshall Foundation and Cadet Command and I and all leaders want to congratulate you. We know you've worked hard, and more importantly, you need to know we're all very, very proud of you. Uh, this is my third year doing this seminar, and I live in Washington, D.C. Uh, if you probably read and watch the news once in a while, it's not a fun place to be. I get very depressed. Uh, but when I start driving down 81, knowing I'm coming down here, uh, I start getting reinvigorated. And when I see you walk in from the buses, I, I say, okay, this country is going to be okay. Uh, in fact, I, I dread having to go back up to D.C. We've got a good format for you this, this year again. Uh, you're going to get all kinds of topics. Uh, you're going to get to uh, look at the Battle of uh, Roberts Ridge, the Battle of Wanot. We've got some cyber warriors that come in and talk to you about that. We've got discussions and seminars on Pakistan and on uh, other parts of the world. And uh, we also have got uh, what I think is just as important, and, and more so now than ever because of the challenges we have in the world. You're going to get some uh, leadership and ethics uh, uh, by some of our great leaders. So pay attention. You won't learn as much. You'll be stimulated but you won't learn as much from your instructors as you should learn from each other. Uh, so take this time. All of you come from different schools, some great schools. I saw a NEMI patch. Uh, anybody from NEMI? Yeah. Both my sons are grads. Broncos, right? Yeah, yeah I spent a lot of money there. Uh, <laughs> you know, my kids wanted to take five years of schooling rather than four. Uh, but you're going to learn a lot from each other. And the bonds you make these next two or three days, uh, you're going to see each other again on uh, post camps and stations throughout your career. Uh, you're going to see each other in the combat zone. Uh, and the friendships you make here, as well as the friendships you make when you go through your basic course, that's where a lot of that learning is going to happen. So uh, each one of you received, I see you carry these books. Uh, up front, I haven't copyrighted any of this stuff. Uh, some of it I took from General P. Uh, but this is what I've learned over 37 years. Some of it I got from great NCOs. So I'd ask you to just kind of use it as a, a reflection point for you as uh, you get ready to uh, pin on those bars and become a uh, platoon leader and a leader in our Army. These are things that uh, I learned over 37 years, uh, the mistakes I've made, uh, and tried to learn from them. So we wanted to impart that on you. Um, you are joining an army, our army, uh, at really a cr critical inflection point in the history of our army, and as well as our nation. Make no mistake, uh, this is a critical time for all Americans and, and quite frankly, for the, uh, for the globe. The world we live in is no longer stabilized by the two competing ideals of the Cold War, communism and democracy, or the deterrence of mutually assured destruction. Since the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, there has been no peace dividend. The gravitational pull of the two superpowers has dissipated. 
And since 1989, the United States and our NATO allies have deployed forces to hotspots across the globe over 100 times. This is truly a time of testing, testing of our resolve, testing of our national will as Americans, a testing of our politicians to get our fiscal house in order and our foreign policies in balance with the rapid changing global dynamics. And for those in our military, it is a testing of the resolve of this all-volunteer force that you joined. And after 11 years of combat, a testing of the bonds of trust, trust soldier to soldier, trust leader to lead, and in Afghanistan, trust U.S. to our NATO allies. Our nation today faces threats that are global, mostly from non-actor states, extremists, cyber criminals, and narco-traffickers in emerging nuclear-capable nation states like North Korea and Iran that promote and support anti-U.S. terrorism through direct threats and their surrogate actors like Hezbollah, Hamas, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram in Nigeria, and Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines. One only has to look at the current global tapestry, the turmoil in the Middle East and the Levants, the Arab Spring uprising in Libya, Egypt, Bahrain, and Tunisia, growing terrorism and unrest in the Arabian Peninsula and in northern Africa, the civil war in Syria, rising sectarian violence in Iraq, and the potential resurgence of Russia and China. To fully understand that our national security, at home and abroad, are being challenged like never before. But I, like you, are instead bombarded by nightly news coverage on the debates in Washington that are focused on our economy, on our out-of-control spending, our mounting capital deficits. Many leaders in uh, Washington have stated that our greatest national security risk to our country is about money. I disagree. Though fighting and writing our fiscal house and putting it in order is extremely important, I think a much greater risk to our country and our national security is a decline in our human capital. Dangers lies in America if our electorate know more about the contestants and vote more for those contestants on Dancing with the Stars and American Idol than they do in their own elections. Voter apathy. We stand a risk if we can't hold on to this all-volunteer force that General P and I joined uh, back in 1973 when we built it and got away from the drafty army. That's a greater risk to our country. You represent 25% of our youth that are mentally, physically, and morally qualified to be in our military. When the all-volunteer force started in 1973, over 80% of our American youth, 17 to 22, met that. So we've had somewhat of a decline. So when people ask me about how's our army doing, I say, geez, we're doing fine because we're getting the top 25% of America's youth standing up and saying, I'll put this uniform on. So we do have some challenges. We can withstand and course correct our fiscal uh, and capital problems in our country and even survive them. But we cannot, however, ever survive a depreciation in our American human capital that made this country so great. Some pundits have opined lately that America is in decline and that our best days are behind us. In spite of these challenges I just described earlier in the world, I firmly believe that we're not a nation in decline and that America has better days ahead. We will get through this current political malaise that we have. So let me shift from the pessimism and talk to you why I and you should be very optimistic about our future. Our great founding fathers had the ability to dream about a better country, to stake out an experiment in democracy and make it an enduring model for the rest of the world. They did so because they knew that behind their eloquent words in our Declaration of Independence, in our Constitution, that behind their legislation and their domestic and foreign policies was and always will be the true strength of this nation. Brave men and women like you who have stepped forward time and time again in our history and said, send me. I will defend this country. I'm optimistic about the future of America because for the past 11 years, our longest wars, 
Young men and women like you have answered our nation's call to duty. The young soldiers on the front lines today in Afghanistan, who you're about to lead, were nine and 10 years old when New York and the Pentagon were hit on 9-11. They grew up watching the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan on the nightly news. They saw the solemn images of our dead coming home at Dover Air Force Base and the final honors at Arlington Cemetery. They saw the cost and human capital in their hometowns. Yet in spite of this, every year over 250,000 brave and patriotic young Americans like you chose to join our military and took an oath to defend America. They, along with thousands of non-commissioned officers and officers, have served repetitive tours on the battlefields. They comprise this all-volunteer force. I've had the honor of leading them, visiting them in their faraway combat post, and the greater honor of visiting them at our hospitals when they come home wounded. I've been to our amputee centers and our PTSD centers. This generation of soldiers have displayed great courage on and off the battlefield. Many have endured these repetitive tours. They've been immersed in some of the toughest fighting and most complex battlefield challenges we've ever put our army in. But they have maintained their moral compass and at every juncture fought to do what was right rather than do what was expedient or politically correct. This generation of soldiers have shown America and the world their intense sense of duty in the face of adversity, their unwavering honor and their commitment to this country over their personal goals and aspirations. They are our greatest treasure and our greatest asset. They deserve our love, our respect, our support, but most importantly, today, they deserve the finest leadership that this country can provide. And you are those leaders that we look to. You are the new leaders of our Army. And this is why I'm very, very optimistic about the future of our great country. There's a quote out here as you walk out that General Marshall, uh, from General Marshall's, on uh, November 26, 1945, he said, after he received the Distinguished Service Medal from President Truman, and I quote, it is to you men and women of this great citizen army who carried this nation to victory that we must look to for leadership in the critical years ahead. You are young and vigorous, and your service as informed citizens and soldiers will be necessary for the peace and prosperity of the world. I'm honored to be with you today. I'm going to take some of your questions. If you don't ask questions, I can, I got 2020 vision so I can read your name tag and I'll call on you. But God bless you and thanks for being in our army.